Hi, Josh. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? Good. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV. In fact, this is The Wright Show. And you're Josh Barrow. I am. Of Bloomberg View. Yes. You you write the ticker blog, or you contribute to the ticker blog? I'm the, I'm the lead writer for the ticker blog, but a lot of other folks on the Bloomberg View staff contribute to that. But they're not lead. They're not lead, yes. I, I am do, the lead. Do you point that out to them? I Frequently. It's actually, they find it very irritating. Uh-huh. Well, I certainly would. Yeah. So anyway, you're here because, uh, of course, uh, yesterday we saw the release of this uh, secretly recorded video of uh, Mitt Romney that some people think may doom his campaign. And you were the first pundit, I believe, to actually get out there and predict with great confidence that this would happen. I mean, in a, in a post uh, at Bloomberg View that was uh, 6.02 p.m., Near hours after the release of this thing, you wrote, yep. you can mark my prediction now. A secret recording, blah, 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 has killed Mitt Romney's campaign for president. And as I understand it, you have vowed and put this in writing that if, if Romney wins the election, you will resign your position at Bloomberg View <laughs> and leave journalism and become a public school uh, teacher. Is that right? Well, no, on the contrary, I think, you know, we, I think we've learned a lot from the example of Dick Morris, that you can make as many terrible predictions as you want and then continue for some reason to have a career making further predictions. So I think, you know, if, if Romney wins, we'll just shake up the edge of sketch and, mm -hmm. uh, and pretend that uh, this prediction was never made. No, I wouldn't so, actually, because no. I think it can, I think if anything, it will elevate your profile. This, this will be one of many examples of upward failure. I, I congratulate <laughs> you in advance. Thank you. Yeah, no, I figure, you know, everyone needs to blaze their own trail. Um, I mean, honestly, I, th I think the prediction is right. Now, I would say I think Romney was most likely going to lose anyway. Um, so I was going not... po to point that out. But, but right. At least that's a conventional wisdom. I'm actually, I should say, I'm a skeptic on both counts. I don't think, really? I, I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, the election is tightening as we, as we speak or was before this. And I don't, I don't, I'll be surprised if this fundamentally alters things. But anyway, go ahead. Well, so I think, you know, I, I, w I probably would have given Romney about 30% odds before this. And I think it's just, I, I think this event, you know, the, a loss of one or two points is, is enormous for, for that probability of winning. But I, I think the, the, the reason I think this is really important, and I certainly agree that most gaps don't matter, or they matter very little. But what makes Romney especially vulnerable to a mistake like this is that he is the most opaque candidate who's been nominated for president since Richard Nixon. People don't really know what his values and interests are, what his likely policy agenda is. And so they basically have to guess. And people will latch on to things like this much more than they would if he were more transparent and we had other data points that made it clear what, what his values are. Okay. And, and let, can, can I just interject at this point for anybody who may not remember exactly what was revealed or, or at least what he, what he said in this thing? And then you can uh, continue. Okay. He said there are 47% of the people who will vote for the president no matter what. He's saying this to a room of of rich donors. Um, okay. He says, all right, there are 47% who are with him, who are dependent upon government, who believe that they are victims, who believe the government has a responsibility to care for them, who believe that they are entitled to health care, to food, to housing, to you name it. That's an, an entitlement, and the government should give it to them, and they will vote for this president no matter what. And then he says, these are people who pay no income tax. And he goes on, so our message of tax cuts doesn't reach them. Uh, and, and then he says, and so my job is, is not to worry about th those people. I'll never convince them, blah, blah, blah. So that's the, that's the thing you find so damning. Right. It's, he's, he's writing nearly half the country off, and he's insulting them. He's basically calling them losers. And so I think, you know, there's, there's a political truth to, to that, you know, there's polarization, and, you know, his, his vote ceiling probably is somewhere around 52, 53, but you don't want to put it in a way such that you're indicating that you basically, you know, you don't even need to concern yourself with the people who are going to not vote for you. Um, it's, not, it's not presidential, and I, th I think people will find it insulting, even if they're inclined to agree with certain parts of, of the underlying policy critique, which I, I think has its own problems. The other big problem here is that, by attacking have basically nearly half the country for not paying federal income tax, he undermines a message he's trying to send where the Obama campaign is, is hammering him for their what they allege is a middle class tax increase that he's proposing. He basically says over and over again, I'm not going to raise taxes on the middle class. But then why is he complaining that so many of these people, which includes a lot of people who really are middle class, have no federal income tax liability? Doesn't it imply that there really should be a middle class tax increase? Okay. Well, it seems to me there's kind of two issues you've raised one about people who pay no taxes mm -hmm. and, and 
I mean, I guess what I'd say is there's kind of two ways this story can be headlined. Mm -hmm. Romney says about people who, who will vote for Obama the following kind of unflattering right. stuff. Or Romney says about people who don't pay tax, who pay no taxes, the following. Mm -hmm. Right. Those are those are the two possible headlines. And 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 as for the first headline, I mean, for him to insult people who have already decided to vote for Barack Obama, does I don't see him losing any voters from necessarily from doing that. Right. I mean, all the by definition, the people he's insulting were not going to vote for him anyway. Right. Right. But then but I don't I don't think that reflects well for for undecideds who I think don't have the kind of uncharitable view of the Democratic Party and its voters that base Republicans do. I think, you know, the the he's basically saying that 140 million Americans are, are losers who he doesn't even need to bother concerning himself with, which I think is, is not an appealing message, even if you're pretty confident that you're not one of that 140 million. Yeah, although this does raise the question of of. At this point in the election, what? Who are these people who are undecided? Right? I mean, I mean, although, although as you said, Romney's opaque, so maybe they have an excuse for not having made up their mind. I mean, by and large, these are not people who are as well informed as you, and and it's really not totally clear to me what what they are like or what what their views are toward, uh, you know, toward Democrats or anything else, you know. Well, I think people who are still undecided are going to tend to be lower information voters who are the sort of people who should be influenceable by, by these sorts of things that are light on actual policy content and have to do with, I mean, he says, Romney himself says in the clip that some people vote sort of based on emotion and how they feel about the candidates personally. And I think this is, this is the sort of thing that we'll, we'll see over and over again in attack ads from the Obama campaign, reinforcing several themes that already make people nervous about Mitt Romney, that he's out of touch, that he doesn't care about the needs of the poor and the middle class, um, that he might have a secret plan to, to raise your taxes, that he's not a very nice guy. Um, I think the, the when people have been comparing this to a lot of different gaps, but I actually think it's really similar most to the um, I actually voted for the $87 billion before I voted against it thing, mm -hmm. because obviously they're about completely different topics. But in that case, it was a soundbite that could be repeated over and over and over again. And that reinforced an image that had already existed about John Kerry, which is that he was vacillating um, and, and getting on either side of political issues to, to his political advantage with, with no real principles. So I think here the, the problem for Mitt Romney, what makes it harder for him to survive this than for some other politician, is that there's not a lot to point to as evidence that, that, that this doesn't reflect what Romney's really like. And people out there are searching for a way to figure out what Mitt Romney is really like. Okay. Um, what if we imagine an undecided voter who, uh, who pays some taxes and he complains basically that 47% of Americans don't? Mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe they kind of look into it and realize that actually most of these people are low income, right? I mean, I, I had never thought about this. I got a little educated by this. You know, I read a little background in the Washington Post today, yeah. and it turns out that, yeah, these are, these are aside from senior citizens, mm -hmm. uh, they are mostly low income people, either the working low income who maybe, maybe benefit from earned income tax credit or something, or mm -hmm. the out and out, you know, just, just poor and often unemployed. Um, so suppose you're an independent voter who pays their taxes and you go, you know, he's right. This is scandalous. I mean, I'm working hard. I'm paying taxes. You know, that would presumably be, 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 be an undecided voter who is leaning, leaning right, maybe. But isn't that plausible? Well, so I, I think there's certainly a constituency for this line of complaint that basically, you know, we've become a nation of moochers and that, you know, too many people are taking rather than making. Um, I don't think that's a point that sells to a majority coalition. I think it mostly sells to people who are already in Romney's base. And there's, you know, been a fair amount of, of commentary on the right basically saying, you know, well, I like what, what Mitt Romney had to say there. I, I think that there is an audience for this message. I just don't think it's a, it's a good message for the median voter. As for, you know, who doesn't pay taxes and who people think doesn't pay taxes, with that Washington Post demographic, I, I think that w when you look at people who pay neither income nor payroll taxes, almost all of them were either senior citizens whose income consisted mostly of Social Security benefits, which get favorable tax treatment, and then people with income below $20,000 a year. Um, but there is a significant chunk of people there, about uh, something like nearly 30% of the population, that pays uh, payroll tax but does not pay income tax. Um, and those people can be uh, well into the well into the middle class. 
Um, if you have a family of four with an income around $50,000, it's very likely that they have no federal income tax liability. Um, so certainly people who don't pay tax are disproportionately poor, but it's not rare for somebody to be middle class with no income tax liability if they have uh, several children and, and other, other, other situations that, that gain them favorable tax treatment. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you have a handful of people who are actually fairly wealthy who have unusual tax situations such as all they own is municipal bonds and then they, and then they don't pay tax. So I, I think the question you're getting at though is do people, nearly half of Americans don't pay federal income tax but a lot more than, a lot more than half of Americans think they pay federal income tax. Exactly. Uh, Which seems to me to challenge your thesis a, a little because it suggests that a lot of these people don't realize he's insulting them. But I think the, the, the reason Romney's remarks are so damaging is that it's not just complaining that people aren't paying income tax. It was basically a personal insult at the, you know, the entirety of, of the president's base. And then also, even though these are, in fact, overlapping and not coextensive groups, people who don't pay income tax. I think the idea that these people, you know, think they're victims and they can't be convinced to take responsibility for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, I think is, is a fairly, it, it's a fairly extreme thing to say about these groups that I think coming from some rich guy does not sell very well. I think, you know, people like to think of America as a country of strivers where people are, are trying to um, improve their situations and, and are willing to work hard. Um, and so I think the message that nearly half the country is basically shiftless um, isn't an appealing message, even to people who are concerned about whether, you know, whether the government has, has built too generous an entitlement state and whether that, that needs to be pared back. I think the problem is that it's really, it's not blaming the policy, it's actually blaming the public. Um, and saying that you know the, these people don't don't want to take initiative over their own lives. The usual Republican talking point is that people want to take initiative, and the government has basically you know the it's the Paul Ryan thing. You know, we need we need a safety net, not a hammock, right. um, and we we need the government to stop coddling people so that they can they can realize their their um, their, their ambitions. Romney seems to be basically saying that the the people are just lazy. Okay. Now, what about the base uh, mobilizing aspect of this on both sides? I mean, we've been talking about, like, undecided voters. Okay. But you can make a case that, on the one hand, um, this will so insult some mm -hmm. Obama leaners mm -hmm. that they will get out there and vote where they wouldn't have. You can also argue that there are people in the Republican base who will mm -hmm. go, yeah, let, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, a, it's uh, the same people who would respond to the kind of welfare queen, you know, uh, is, do you think either of those is going to happen? Well, so I think I think it will be base mobilizing on the left, and I think we've seen the Obama campaign capitalizing on this. They put out a piece of artwork today that's like the it's like a children's like uh, work exercise book where the um, it's a map of the United States with guidelines for cutting it out, and it says Mitt Romney, show us which forty percent seven percent of the country you don't care about. Uh, they put out videos. I, I expect. As with, you know, the I voted for the $87 billion before I voted against it, I think the Obama campaign will hammer this over and over again. And I think it is a message that appeals to Democratic-based voters who might be demoralized because, frankly, the, the president has been pretty underwhelming, um, but uh, who, you know, and who really are, are primed to not like this sort of plutocratic thing from, from the right. As for mobilizing the conservative base, I think the problem for Romney is that he has to, to walk too thin a line on that. There, there is definitely a market for this, and Rush Limbaugh was celebrating the fact that Romney is finally bringing conservatism out to show to people. And, uh, but uh, the the campaign can't run with this. They can't like go the full Todd Akin and say, you know, we're we're gonna well, not Todd Akin. Who was the? Oh, it was Joe, Joe Wilson who made the "you lie" comment? Mm -hmm. And there was all this um, people? There was consternation about it for a day, and then he decided he was going to run with it and raise millions of dollars from base Republicans who who liked his outburst. Mm -hmm. Romney can't do that because he has to appeal to the center. He had to say things like that his his remarks were um, uh, inartful. Was that the word he used yesterday? I would have. I don't know if he did. Um, so I don't I don't think the campaign can decide that it's going to own this message. Um, I think they have to be. Uh, so that I think helps. That undermines their ability to m mobilize whatever aspects of their base would like this. You also have the problem that people like Bill Crystal are coming out with the bats for Romney over this. It, it, if there's going to be conservative base mobilization about it, the conservative pundits don't seem to have gotten on board with the idea that what Romney said is great and we should repeat it. Yeah. Um... What about the question of whether the these low information undecided voters pay much attention to even something that creates what seems to us such a big splash like this? 
Well, again, I think, you know, the, um, well, the, the piece that I wrote about it on Bloomberg has gotten 600,000 hits so far. So I think um, there's, you know, there's a certain amount we, of We math. don't know that any of those is an undecided voter. We don't know that. But, Wait, it's, uh, gotten, it's gotten how many hits? About 600,000. And that and may be that, that may be that may hold the Bloomberg view record, may it not? Uh, yeah, it's the um, it's that's uh, why you're the lead blogger. That's that's why I'm the lead blogger. Right. Um, no, but uh, the um, I the interesting thing about the traffic is that it went really viral on Facebook, which is unusual. Usually stuff I write and other stuff we do does more uh, more on Twitter than on Facebook. I think partly because Twitter is favored by, you know, professional media right. and, and politics people. Facebook is a sign that people who don't do don't do this stuff for a living are sharing it with each other because they they find this galling. So I think the I, I think there is a sign that this is something that's that's breaking through into the into the mass consciousness for people who don't follow politics every day and aren't paying attention to whatever the outrage is in, in today's news cycle. And then the other thing is that I think the Obama campaign will stoke it by, you know, using the footage over and over again in ads and, and other ways to get the video in front of people whether they want to see it or not. Yeah. Um, I wonder if Mother Jones owns the rights to it. You know, they could make some money. <laughs> but, uh, it's been cute the way they've been releasing it in dribs and drabs. They're they're clearly trying to, to milk this for, for what they yeah, can. Today they did the foreign policy stuff. And by the way, do you have a view on whether that hurts or helps him? I mean, it... I don't it, think it matters. Yeah. Um, I don't think that... Um, uh, first of all, I think it's not a foreign policy election. Um, and then I think... You know, substantively, what he said, I think, was, was pretty objectionable. But I, I don't think you can lose an election in the United States by getting too far to the right on Israel. No, I, you could argue that it helps him. Abstract way, like he did. But I, couldn't you argue that it helps him in, 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 say, Florida to say, you know, Palestinians aren't interested in peace and blah, blah, blah? Um, I don't. I, I'm, the Republicans always have big hopes for doing well with the Jewish vote. And they always seem to end up around 20 um, percent. So I don't. I, I don't know how much that that matters at the at the margin in uh, Florida. And again, I think there's a, a difficulty in trying to capitalize on remarks he made that were supposed to be private. I guess he can try to to pump up what he said, um, but it, but it would be uh, that that would seem really strange for him to be promoting his own leaked video. And and without that, I, I don't know how much that that's going to penetrate. Yeah, it, well, it would only reach I guess high information voters probably. Uh. Who, who already have their minds up, made up right. for the most part that's probably true okay so have you um have you had second thoughts i mean have you have you had these these uh these moments did you did you uh not, not at any point wake up last night and go wait a second i'm gonna look pretty stupid i i, I think i think it's right i mean i think you know it's not it, it's not utterly impossible that uh that something could happen in the next month that would cause Romney to win to, to win the election. But I think that this moved moved the scale sufficiently enough that he's you know, a, a very low chance candidate now in a way that he was merely an, an, an underdog before. Because I, I really I, I expect this thing to have legs. Um, and I think I think it's going to continue to dog him. It's gonna provide powerful messages for the president to use over over the next month and a half. And I think Romney I, I was actually struck how tired Romney looked in his press conference last night. Um, he looked he looked almost haggard, um, and I don't know whether that was unrelated events of the day. But I, don't, I, it's it's weird for the the you know the all of a sudden they called this instant press availability at like 10 p.m. Um, and and he gives these remarks that I think didn't come off very well, which suggests to me that they the campaign thinks this was a big deal and something they really need to get out in front of. He's going to be on on Fox at four o'clock today. Um, and so I think the, the campaign views this as having been a serious problem, and that's still my view as well. Um, I'm partly protected by the fact that he was probably going to lose anyway. So um, even if I was wrong about the call, then you know there, there, there won't be damning evidence in the form of him winning the election. Um, but I, I, I really think this is a big deal in a, in a way that gaffes generally are not. Um, do you think we're going to see a, a discernible drop in his numbers or it's going to be more of a, a, a drip 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 thing I think it's I think it's going to drip 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 I think it's going to be the the reuse and reuse of this message by the Obama campaign over the next month and a half and the other thing is that I think partly it's going to show up as enthusiasm um, I think this is a useful thing for the Democrats to use to motivate their base to get them out to the polls so that that can show up in the polls but it's you know, it's the it doesn't necessarily get through you know who, who actually changed this whether they're a likely voter or not 
Um, but um, I, I, we'll see if, the, if if the polls look the same a month from now than they than they did that they do today. Then that will be evidence that uh, my my call was was incorrect. Um, but uh, I don't I don't know that I expect a, I, I, I don't expect a surge in the polls over the next three or four days. Mm -hmm. Now things have been. Uh moving a little in his direction in the polls, have they not? I mean, the, the Gallup tracking poll took another drop mm -hmm. down for Obama today. The last yep. six days, I think, every every day has been either level or a drop on the Gallup. Mm -hmm. The Rasmus and the, the other main kind of tracking poll, I guess, has, has moved in the same direction. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, would you have a, a kind of a theory about that? I mean, my view all along has been that... Uh, that this, that notwithstanding uh, Romney's uh, arguably bumbling initial response to the, uh, you know, to the Muslim protests and, and the Libyan embassy thing, that, that by and large this whole crisis is 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 bad for Obama. And I think so far the numbers are consistent with that. But I think it's mostly a fading of his convention bounce. The, um, and I think the the crisis looks to me like it's it's peaked. I mean, we'll see. Uh, obviously, that could change. The situation is unpredictable. Um, but I, I, I would attribute the, the decline in the tracking poll mostly to, to, the, to the end of the convention balance. Um, I think the, the story in Libya and Egypt would have been a lot worse for the president if Romney hadn't stepped in it with his quick statement. Because I think, yeah, it's, you know, it's a serious question. Why didn't, why didn't we have more security in, in Benghazi? Why did, the, why did this essentially logistical failure happen that led to these deaths? Um, and I think the, that, that's a question that would have been a lot more challenging for the administration if Romney hadn't been a big distraction. Um, but I don't, um, I, I, I honestly, you know, the, I think part of the reason that I didn't think the, uh, the, the Libya gap was that big a deal for Romney was that I really, I, I just don't think people are voting on foreign policy in, in this election. I don't think that, I, I think Obama has a case to make that uh, the Republicans are, are scary and unpredictable on foreign policy, but I don't think that they're going to um, be able to stick Romney with that that effectively just because people aren't going to delve into the depth of these foreign policy statements in the way that they would need to to confirm that claim from Obama. Okay. Uh, so I, don't, I, I just don't think that it matters that much either way electorally and unless things get much, much worse and there are a lot more American deaths. Yeah, although, you know, that can happen. It's a wild world. It, it can happen, but I, I'm, you know, I certainly hope it won't. Um, and uh, I, you know, I think it probably won't. Mm -hmm. And I guess the other thing that should worry a person in your shoes. I mean, first of all, it, 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 it would be the the general moral of the story of this whole of the Muslim protest thing, which is that weird stuff unexpectedly happens in the world, and and how a president and his challenger happen to respond. Mm -hmm. you know, can shape things. I mean, I don't think Obama's response to this thing has been very deft personally. Uh, and, and, you know, you can imagine wholly different kinds of crises. Well, remember Katrina, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. the, 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 who would have thought that flying over, you know, Katrina in an airplane would be one of these things that haunts you, right? Yeah. So, I mean, what well, is that? Lehman, I think is the best example of this. What's it, that? This is, Lehman Brothers, I think, is the best example of this, is the crisis that really hit right before an election where people at least say that John McCain's sort of frantic uh, reaction hurt him electorally. I think, you know, I, I think the falling apart of the economy hurt McCain in that election um, more than, than, his act, than his reaction to it. Um, but I think that's, you know, the, th that was an example of, of a crisis that arose and McCain did not respond in a way that suggested that he would provide good leadership in a similar crisis as, as president. But usually there isn't a game-changing crisis like that in the six weeks before an election. So I certainly wouldn't bank on that appearing. And if it did, I wouldn't bank on, you know, one of the candidates mishandling it so badly that it affects the, the electoral outcome. And do you think bad economic news is just almost built into expectations, G given the fact that, you know, the, the last, like, jobs report was hardly inspiring, but it didn't seem mm -hmm. to really dent Obama's position? No, well, I think, first of all, I don't think the public reacts directly to jobs reports. I think a jobs report that showed a, a net job loss could matter for the president, but otherwise, you know, undecided voters aren't picking up the paper and saying, well, we had 80,000 new jobs instead of 150,000, and that's why I'm going to vote for Romney. The jobs report matters in that it's an indicator of economic performance, and economic performance matters for the electoral outcomes. But we're close enough to the election now that if the economy continues, you know, at the weak recovery pace it's at now, I think that's built in. And I think 
Um, I mean, again, you could have an event like another financial collapse um, that would have real economic impacts on the election, but usually that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. and of course, the, the the other big variable is is the debates, right? Yeah. yeah. But and, I, and don't you think it hurts Obama that he probably will go in with the higher expectations? I mean, I think he's a little overrated as a debater. I've never been that wowed by his uh, performance. And, and don't you think at this point Romney has such a reputation as a kind of a klutz that if he shows up and finishes his sentences, the worst, you know, the worst that it'll be judged as a tie? Oh, I, th I think it'll be judged as a, as, a, as a tie probably. I think Romney's actually a very strong debater. Um, I, although he hasn't debated somebody as good as Barack Obama since he dated, debated Ted Kennedy 18 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, the debates were a strength for him in the primaries. They were a strength for him in his run for governor in 2002. Um, but I, it's, it's hard to think of examples where the debates really mattered. I, the, the, uh, did the debate matter in 1976 when Gerald Ford said that there's no Soviet domination of Poland? I, I feel like that's the... That's the last. Yeah, but that was foreign policy. What about was it? Uh, when when was uh, wasn't? Are you better off than you were four years? Wasn't that debuted in a debate? Or am I wrong? I I don't know whether it debuted in the debate. It was in the, uh, the closing statement in one of the Carter Reagan debates. Um, but you know the. I think you could have debated that. You you could have debuted that message anywhere. You could have done it in a speech. So I don't I, I don't know that. Um, uh, also, I don't. I don't think that that mattered at the margin in that election outcome. Um, mm -hmm. So you think debates are overrated? I do. I mean, I, I like. I think they're useful in that they require candidates to talk specifically about policy. I think they're good for governance. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's rare that they affect the outcomes of elections. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess the final question is: I think I, I've seen you described as a conservative. Is that true? Uh, people uh, describe me as a conservative. I don't describe myself as a conservative. I, I tend to refer to myself as a neoliberal. I'm much more wary of regulation than of, of taxes and transfers. But you're liberal uh, on social issues. Yeah. So you're so you're kind of in this kind of libertarian. No, well, but you know the yeah. the, the, the the somewhat libertarian mm -hmm. uh, people who who cannot be ruled out as Obama supporters. The people who were kind of helpful last time around. Right, I agree with Brink Lindsay and Will, Will Wilkinson on a lot of things. Um, I'm somewhat to the right of Matt Iglesias, um, but uh, many it's, people are. What's that? Many people are to yes. the right of Matt Iglesias. Yeah, well, um, but I mean, Matt sort of has this this interesting position with regard to the left, where he is uh, opposed to. I mean, he likes banking regulation and regulation on on healthcare firms and that sort of thing, but he's broadly opposed to various other parts of the regulatory framework that get people angsty at him from the left. So I sort of, I, I have a, a similar viewpoint on what the government should and shouldn't do, but with s smaller preferences as to how, how large exactly the welfare state should be. But I'm, I'm not opposed to one. I think that uh, I, I think that income transfer programs are an important way that we Im improve people's livelihoods. Okay. Um, but so, um, I mean, I, I worked for the Manhattan Institute. I'm a registered Republican um, for some reason. Um, but uh, well, you probably know better than anyone how that came to be. <laughs> but uh, I mean, I I'm closer to the center than to the right, but I'm closer to the right than to the left. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that, makes sense. Uh, that does make sense. So you're 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 barely right of center on yeah. balance. So, so neoliberal, would you, I mean, neoliberal has two meanings. One is the kind of Charlie Peters, Washington Monthly, Mike Kinsley sense, which is a little close to the meaning of new Democrat, you know. And yeah. then there's this, that has largely been eclipsed by the meaning in international economics, I think. Right. I mean, what, yeah. What, but yeah. You mean uh, it, you mean it kind of in the Washington Monthly sense? I mean it more in the Washington Monthly sense, yeah. Okay, well, then you really shouldn't have registered Republican. That was a mistake. <laughs> it's, I've, I've been a Republican forever. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's up to you. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, I was I was wondering because uh, I was thinking if you're a Romney supporter and you don't have to declare your uh -huh. your your prediction could have been uh, the the result of being a pessimistic Romney supporter. It's like mm -hmm. I support Obama and I tend to interpret and I'm pessimistic, uh -huh. so I tend to see I tend to interpret everything as as being good for Romney. But, but that's not, this is not a similarly uh, pathological dynamic at work in your brain, it sounds like. No, I mean, I've been, I've been undecided. I'm now pretty sure that I'm going to vote to reelect the president. 
Um, I I actually was was very upset about the uh, about Romney's uh, uh, Libya response. Um, and I'm not I'm not I don't write just about just the, just the cheapness of it kind of. It, no, actually, the, what bothered me about it, I mean, it was cheap, but, you know, lots of things that he does and that other political candidates do aren't cheap. Um, what bothered me about it is that it's, I, I think, and the, it's clear that the campaign was divided internally about whether they wanted to react so quickly. And the impression I get is that this was something that Romney didn't actually do for reasons of political calculation. It actually really pissed him off. Um, what really? the uh, what the administration had done, and I, I think he did it out of peak, and I think it's a sign that when Romney s s uh, um, puts out really hawkish notes on foreign policy, that he's not just pandering. And I, I've been saying for a couple of years that you know I can't see Romney getting us involved in another war. It seems to me like he would view that as a time and money suck. He's a management consultant at heart, and he wants mm -hmm. to. You know, I think he wants to fix the post office and take on lots of other projects like that. And I think he views the government as basically a big management consulting or, or private equity project to just you know make the thing work better, whatever that mm -hmm. means. And it seemed to me that another big foreign war would get in the way of that goal. Um, but I, it really made me reconsider that and suggest that maybe he really actually does intend to get bogged down in some the, other... The Libyan response made you reconsider yeah. that. Because that seems to me so easily explicable as just campaign calculation, however inept. I don't. I don't think it was. I, I think the it. I the impression I got from from reading and and I, I guess you never fully know with these things that have uh, you know on background quotes from campaign staffers distancing themselves. But it suggested to me that it was really Romney personally. Well, yeah, but it's, it still could have been a campaign call. I mean, remember it was coming at a time when it seemed. Uh, the, the polls just seemed to be getting worse and worse and worse for Romney, and it seemed mm -hmm. like he needed a big play. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, I, I, that, that's always possible, but as, you know, especially with Romney and then always in these elections, you're, you're having to make predictions about what the president might do if he were elected. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's possible that he's still blowing smoke, but it, in my view, it, it increased what I think is the likelihood that he's actually serious about what he says on foreign policy, which I think would make him a much worse president than he would be otherwise. So that that really bothered me, um, and I just you know the I, I I've written a, a, a number of times that I think he has a secret economic plan. I don't know what's in it, but the economic plan he has now is so stupid, and furthermore would be so bad for the economy that he would not get reelected. And I think one of the one thing we know about Mitt Romney is that he would want to be reelected after he was elected. Um, so there has it's to be true of a lot, true of a lot of presidents, I think. Yes, yeah. So the, there has to be something else that he's planning, and I don't know whether it's you know the, what com the components are. It could be something aggressive on housing. Maybe he's just going to break all of his commitments on spending cuts and and do tremendous fiscal stimulus through the tax side. Um, there, there's there's something that he plans to do on the economy, and you can contrast that with that he will not unveil before the election. You mean? Oh no. Okay, no. something he's really going to do, but not tell us about. It's like when he ran for governor in Massachusetts, like he did, he gave no indication that he was going to do this radical overhaul of the state's healthcare system and mm -hmm. make a large fiscal commitment to getting health coverage to ninety-eight percent of the state's population. Uh, he just, you know, the, the if you look back at his campaign materials from two thousand two, there's no indication of that, and it's his key policy achievement as governor. So I think there's there's no particular reason to 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 believe that the policy agenda that Romney's laid out in the campaign is the one that he would actually pursue if he were elected. But I don't know what the agenda is that he would pursue. So I've been, for the last few months, trying to come up with my own estimate of what a Romney presidency would be like. And I think the president is basically paralyzed on economic policy. He wanted fiscal stimulus, and he got some as much as he could out of Congress, and then he wanted more, and they said no. And then his next plan was to complain about how Congress would not give him more fiscal stimulus. Um, so I think a, a a secret but effective economic plan from Romney could be better than whatever Obama will do if he's reelected. But it's also possible Romney would do things that are a lot worse, and I've been I'm leaning more and more toward uh, toward that. Mm -hmm. And then there's also just an issue of risk. I can I can assess I think pretty accurately what a second Obama term would be like, and it's plus and minuses. And you know the even if there there's big upside potential with Romney, it might be more important that there's big downside. Yeah, I've been developing the view that it's just inherently better to have a second-term president than a first-term president, because first-term presidents are so constrained. Mm, I don't know. Ronald Reagan got a lot done in his first term.
Well, we may have different views on how valuable that was. <laughs> Whether or not you think it was valuable. No, you can get things done if they have popular support. I guess I put a lot of emphasis on foreign policy where I think popular opinion tends to lead you to do the wrong thing in general in foreign policy. I, I can't think of examples of second-term presidents doing politically unpopular things they wanted to do despite the lack of popular support for them. No, I guess I'm just imagining that, for example, I'm not a big fan of uh, all these drone strikes, and I think they are partly a product of someone who lives in fear of there being a terrorist attack in the United States in the short term, like tomorrow, like within the next four years. Uh, and I think they actually increase the probability of a terrorist attack much down, way down the road. And, and, I, and I've got to think uh, that, that that might change a little if you knew it was your last term anyway, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I, I think the, the best assumption about why the Obama administration does a lot of drone strikes is the simplest one, which is that they think it's a good policy. Well, right, but they think it's a. I think they think it's an effective way to prevent uh, terrorist attacks on America in the short run, and also in some cases attacks on troops. But I think, I think mm -hmm. it's short-term thinking about preventing terrorist attacks, and, and I think it, it it has a long-term cost. Myself, but. Uh, uh, per perhaps, but I think the in a second term the administration will continue for a number of excellent reasons to be focused on presenting preventing terrorist attacks in the short term. Yeah, I'm just not sure they'll have quite quite the urgency. And I mean, the other famous example is, of course, Middle East policy. But um, uh, you know, where it's it's conventional wisdom. Well, even Iran in Iran negotiations, it's conventional wisdom that Obama will have more leeway after the election than before. Mm -hmm. But uh, but we'll see. Yeah. So anyway, I, I, I you've got me so uh, interested in this uh, surprise uh, economic plan of Romney's that I almost hope he'll win, just so that we'll find out. The downside, the downside is that your career is over if he gets, if, if he wins. <laughs> well, I actually have a number of excellent professional reasons to want Romney to win. I mean, first of all, like that this is this is how we get to find out if the secret economic plan is real. If he loses, then then we'll never know. Um, the just more broadly on policy, the next the first six months of 2013 will be much more interesting if Romney is president and is trying to. We'll see what what agenda he really wants to implement and then what level of success he has dealing with both Republicans and Democrats who disagree with him on things. Whereas I think if Obama is reelected, we will have another six months that look a lot like the, the, the year that we just had and, and little will get done on policy. Um, and then I also have a bet that a, f a friend of mine very ill-advisedly made with me that the, he bet me that the president would be impeached. Uh, and uh, Even money? Yes. Yeah. You should hang out with smarter people. <laughs> I don't understand that at all. Well, so, but uh, the, the bet doesn't pay off until Obama is no longer president. So I'm going to win it either way, but I have to wait another four years if he gets reelected. So um, I, uh, I see your incentive structure, yes. Yes. So I had, you know, the work-wise, uh, you know, Mitt Rom President Mitt Romney would be the gift that keeps on giving for me. Um, but uh, I don't, uh, I, and I think that would offset uh, the loss of face that I would have from uh, from my prediction having proved horrible. Yeah. Oh, I think I think you're you're being wrong. Will I will be almost actively good for your career because if you're right, people just go, well, everyone was predicting Obama's victory at that point. That's nothing special. But if you're wrong, people will taunt you, and that will elevate your profile. That will be like my Dow thirty six thousand. Exactly. Those guys are world famous. Jim Glassman and what is it, Kevin Hazlitt or? Kevin Hassett, yeah. Hassett. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Where are they now? <laughs> no, Jim Glassman. Works. They're at the, uh, Hassett is at the American Enterprise Institute, and Glassman uh, runs the George W. Bush Institute. So there you go. Yeah. Onward and upward. Okay. Well, good <laughs> luck with it. It's, it that's sounds cool. like it can't lose proposition for you. Uh, that's, that's certainly my hope. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks a lot. Thanks, Bob. Okay, see ya.